Chapter Twenty Three of Curly by Roger Pocock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read it by Matt Perard. Chapter Twenty Three: A House of Refuge. Looking back upon the whole discussion between the Duchesne and Ryan families, I see myself sitting around meek and patient, shy, timid, cautious, and fearfully good, and yet I got all the blame of course i ought to have shot old man ryan just as an early precaution so it's best to own up that i was all in the wrong for dallying but after that there was the massacre of the leading grave city felons i got the blame next came the hunting and escape of curly and jim i got the blame furthermore there was the flight of curly and jim from la morita prison followed by business transactions with the frontier guards i got the blame and moreover there was the sliding out of curly jim and the robbers from cocky brown's ranch at la soledad with certain vain pursuits by a posse of citizens i got the blame lastly there was the stealing of all the horses and a millionaire out of grave city i got the blame whatever happened i always got the blame it's plumb ridiculous now taking this last case what ground is there for supposing that i helped mccalmont's robbers my movements all that night were innocent and unobtrusive travels when doggone hawkins went off with his tenderfoot posse to hunt ghosts i naturally slid out for home so i met up with mccalmont took charge of cocky brown's old buckboard and delivered curly at the back door of my cousins the mrs jameson these ladies had to hear a whole lot which was pretty near true about poor curly and that consumed some time afterwards they got scared all to fits by rushes of horsemen dynamite explosions and such diverting incidents ending with the arrival of shorty brooch to have his prickles pulled through this disturbance i hid up with curly in a cellar and when there was peace drove off alone with my saddled horse tied behind the buckboard after an hour's search i found the old cordeline mine shaft and tipped the buckboard in turning the team horses loose to graze their way back to la soledad my duties being all performed i rode back just before dawn to my own home pasture at las salinas there is the whole annals of a virtuous night and yet these grave city idiots defame my character which it makes me sick there's a habit which i caught from the old patron at holy cross the same being to have a cold bath our arizona water is mostly too rich for bathing being made of mud cow dung alkali and snakes but at las salinas i owned a little spring quite good for washing in such emergencies after my bath i felt skittish a whole lot younger than usual full of aching memories about getting no supper last night and pleased all to pieces to hear the breakfast howl these symptoms being observed custer proposed at once that i pay up the overdue wages and ute backed his play grinning ugly as for monte he was chipped in the face with a recent bullet and squatted heaps thoughtful over his pork and beans so you all want your pay they agreed that they did and custer passed me the biggest cup for my coffee all right you tigers says i after this grub pile we'll cyclone into town and catch what i've got in the bank i ain't no tiger this time says ute why yesterday i just rode up street to collect my washing and the weather was a lot too prevalent rain says i you surely didn't have rain well it splashed up the dust all around me it did that says ute but i sort of mistook it for bullets then those boys allowed that we was getting some unpopular in town but they had a gnawing awful pain in their pants pockets and nothing would cure that but wages they were sure 
good boys and it made me ache inside to see them want you boys says i suppose you collect these here wages yourselves and make your own settlement as how this ute inquires his homely face twisting around into strange new species of grins why you all knows every hoss i've got and your notions of value just you whirl right in boys and take what's coming to you in hosses instead of cash pay yourselves liberal and i'll sign the bills shame says monty do you think we'd take your pets in the end we agreed to go into partnership the which we did for those boys were as good as brothers from the moment i got into trouble monty is my partner still now in course of these details while we sat smoking cigarettes around the door of the cabin we saw a sort of dust cloud come rolling along out of the city which reminds me says ute that the grave city stranglers was proposing yesterday to come and hold a social gathering here mr davies they're aiming to hang you some we rolled the rain barrels into the house we toted bales of hay for barricades and let our saddle horses into cover then put in the rest of our time filling the water butts in all we had forty minutes to prepare for our guests but wanted a whole lot more you chalkeye says young monty in his thoughtful way you can talk the hind leg off a mule s'pose you make big war medicine to these here strangers until we're ready custer had got joyful as he always did when there was trouble coming making little yelps of bliss don't talk them off the range says he or we'll get no fight you he lay low saying nothing but he sure grinned volumes while he whirled in with his axe cutting twelve loopholes through the dobe walls i told custer to break a hole in the roof and get up there quick because the parapet had rain spouts most convenient for shooting monte was laying out the ammunition i was spreading wet blankets over the hay barricade in the front doorway and then the vigilance committee came slanting down for battle seeing that grave city was shy of horse flesh that morning these people had done their best with thirty head using them to haul wagons and buckboards full of men only the chairman was in the saddle he being old mutiny robertson who wanted to buy my ranch and not to burn it i ought to mention that this gentleman was a cherokee indian by birth a white man by nature and some time a robber himself he knew what sort of lightning had struck grave city during the night but his feelings did him credit and he kept his mouth shut as chief of the vigilantes he had to go against all his natural instincts but still he acted hostile and looked dangerous leading his men until he came up against my door you chaka he shouted i put up my head behind the barricade in the doorway wall says i this compliment gentlemen throws my tail high with pride put your hosses in the barn while i fix the breakfast these barricades says mutiny is intended hospitable eh chaka which says i they're raised in celebration of my thirty-third birthday as a token of innocent joy seems to me he responds that this year day is apt to be remembered hereaways as the anniversary of your quitting out from this mortal life these predictions of yours says i is rude you're due to die some right now he poked his gun come out i'm remarks says i on general principles that you all has come to mourn at the wrong funeral my obsequies is postponed indefinite now chalkeye says he it's no use arguing so you want to come out like a man we're full prepared to give you a decent turn-off and a handsome funeral i'm sorry to disappoint you gentlemen but i has other engagements and this is my busy day i listen to my boys getting ready keep them amused says monty we need three more loopholes if you don't come out 
says mutiny there's going to be trouble cause we're getting tired while mutiny i'd surely admire to know some trifling details first cause you've aroused my interest in this year celebration why for is my neck so much in need of stretching this year is frivolous argument says he we all is here to hang you not to waste time in debates you has my sympathy says i and i shares your poignant feelings about not wasting time what's the use of a necktie social without an appropriate victim now there's young mose balls beside you which i don't like the look of his neck the same being much too short for a stand-off collar what's the matter with hanging moses balls come out says mose or we'll burn your den you horse thief being possessed of genius moses you'll now proceed to set my dobe home in flames the glare of your fierce eye is enough to burn brick walls bullet whizzed past my ear and i got mad ready yelled monte give the word and we fire and now says i you innocent pilgrims you've given me heaps of time to get my twelve men ready you've got three men in your posse who could hit a house from inside the rest being as gun shy as a school of girls i've got a bullet-proof fort with the twelve best shots in arizona and if you don't get absent quick i'll splash your blood as high as the clouds i give you two minutes to get out of range the weaker men began to rabbit the best of them saw a whole row of loopholes with projecting guns the leaders were holding a council of war one minute says i then turned to shout to my garrison men on the roof pick out the leaders to kill when i give the word men on the right shoot all hosses you can or them reptiles is due to escape men on the left attend to mutiny ninety seconds ninety-five seconds half the grave city crowd was stampeding for the wagons the rest were scared of getting left afoot one hundred seconds mutiny's counselors were breaking for cover one hundred and five ten ten more seconds mutiny turned and bolted one two three when i give the word ready fire we sprinkled the tails of the stranglers until there was nothing left to see but smoke and dust nobody stayed to get hurt my cousins the two mrs jameson admit right free and candid that my past life is plumb deplorable that my present example would corrupt the morals of a penitentiary and that my future state is due to be disagreeable in a place too hot to be mentioned they remark that my face is homely enough to scare cats that my manners and customs are horrid that my remarks are a whole lot inaccurate and that most of my property is stolen goods at the same time they say that i'm nice and there i agree with them my face may not amount to being pretty my virtues haven't reached the level of bigotry but i feel in my bones that i'm a sure nice man being nice i aim to be liked i hunger for popularity and that is just where i blame the grave city stranglers i've been misunderstood i've not been appreciated but why should i be taken out and lynched it's plumb ridiculous now i don't claim that i had any mission to reform the morals of the vigilance committee which they have none or to correct their views the same being a whole lot steeped in error neither would it be right for me to encourage them in the evil work of stretching my neck on a rope or to lead them into the temptation of shooting me any more when one gets disliked and discouraged by the hostile acts of mean people one needs to have presence of mind and plenty absence of body wherefore i did right in rounding up all my livestock and quitting a locality where my peace of mind was disturbed with the ropes gunfire and other evil communications i took my riders and my herd away north to where we could graze peaceful and virtuous amid the untroubled solitudes of the superstitious mountains there was work to do a drive of a hundred and seventy miles with slow-moving stock then scouting for water and feed on the new pasture 
a permanent camp to make and much besides which filled up four good weeks afterwards i tracked a mountain sheep up to the bare heights where all the rock was glazed with lightning and the desert lay below me i sat on my tail to think feeling lonesome then looking east toward texas and wondering if my poor old mother was still alive westward the sun was setting and that way lay the great pacific ocean bigger than all the plains where the ships rode herd upon their drove of whales i wanted to see that too but then i looked southeast the way i had come through valleys of scrub and cactus there somewheres beyond the hills was my little ranch and all the good pasture away to holy cross my heart was crying inside me but i didn't know what i wanted until i thought of curly sure enough i wanted her most of all next morning i told all my boys good-bye and streaked off to go see curly i rode till dusk and camped with texas bob a friend of mine who told me i was sure enough idiot for getting outlawed next evening i came to the house where my cousins lived and crept in the dusk to scratch their back door i found miss blossom jameson all in a bustle as usual which looked mighty natural she was in the back yard feeding supper to her horse and that poor victim leaned up against the fence to groan there were corn stalks in it cabbage leaves lettuce leaves tea leaves and some relics of ham and eggs now just you sail right in mr hoss and don't act wasteful or you'll go with that mr horse took a snuff at the mess then backed away disgusted well if that don't beat all now you hoss you don't want to eat the flower beds or you'll get murdered mr horse turned his back and sulked there that's what i call the mean spirit and i'm going to lock you up you and your supper till one of the two gets eaten i don't care which so the lady chased mr horse into the barn and threw the pig feet in after him i'll learn you to know what's good says she and slammed the door on his tail well she stood with her back to the door and threw up her nose at the sight of me i do wonder says she that you dare to show your wicked face i allowed that my good face was getting a bit mended since our last encounter how's my kid says i you're savage you mean now don't you say you've brought pet tigers this time or tame dragons cause i'll have no more strays at all i've got a roan hoss here who's run a hundred miles since daybreak bring him in then he says he's a vegetarian and can't eat ham and eggs i don't care says miss blossom we killed our pig to-day and the slops has just got to be eaten waste is ruin my hoss says he'll eat the slops ma'am if he can have a drink of whiskey along with the supper hmm. so you want your vile debaucheries in spite of all i told you against drink well i suppose you'll have it she ran off to fetch the liquor which gave me time to bury her salad in the manure heap and get a decent feed of cornstalks down from the loft then i used the whiskey to rub down my weary horse the same being medicine both for man and beast i had some myself while miss blossom stood by talking of wicked waste and how curly had been neglected why she moaned like a man then a girl s'pose ma'am says i that you've been working in a stable and got shot then run into jail and pulled out through a hole in the wall and doctored by a robber and chased around the hills my habits are set says miss blossom so i can't suppose any such thing but that wig of curly's that skirt those now did your robber baron steal those things off a scarecrow or did they grow by themselves then she grabbed my hands there says she that's off my mind so don't look worried the dear little soul she's the bravest sweetest thing and the way she bore all that pain why you or any other man would have sat around cursing all day and groaning all night but curly why she never even whimpered 
now i ask you is it possible she shot those two men i can't believe a word so it's no use your talking was miss pansy very much scared with curly's talk miss pansy my good man is a fool although i say it of all the romantic nonsense and sentimental but thugger she writes poetry my dear and that accounts for her why if i hadn't locked her up in her room that woman would have sent off a poem all about lady outlaws to the new york sunday companion i burned the stuff and she had to go off in hysterics shucks she puts curly off to sleep every night with her fool poems and such trash now there she is with her glue glue harp singing to curly if she don't be cats you listen away off in the house i could hear miss pansy's thin little voice and glue glue harp i thought it sounded fine laws stole or strayed on tuesday night the finder tries to hind it a woman's heart he has no right and there's a love inside it the owner fears twas snatched away but this is a reminder that she is quite prepared to pay one half with thanks to find her miss blossom led me to the house you come right into the settin room says she and keep your tearin spurs off my new carpet i did my best about the spurs but it would take an indian scout to find a safe trail across that parlor floor the same being cluttered up with little fool tables these same tables were of different breeds three-legged two-legged one-legged tumble over all to pieces trip you up and smash the crockery so it was a sure treat to watch miss pansy curving around without the slightest accident her paws were folded in front her tail came swishing behind her head came pecking along in fashion and her smile was sweet enough to give me toothache oh she bubbled i'm so glad you didn't get lynched by those horrid men who never wash themselves or think of serious things and it's so nice to see you looking so brown with that beautiful cherry silk kerchief round your neck and the wonderful leather leggings and that dreadful revolver so picturesque so you're making a fool of yourself says miss blossom and the man wants feeding picturesque bosh shoo she chased miss pansy out of the room as to curly she lay on the sofa kicking high with joy chalka she howled you old hoss thing keep your tearing spurs off my new carpet you picturesque beautiful leather-faced cock-eyed robber wear tables or they'll bite your legs oh gimme your paw to shake and throw me a cigarette look out that chair's going to buck i sat on the edge of the chair and grabbed her hand while she called me all sorts of pet names then it seems that miss pansy broke loose from miss blossom and came surging back for she heard the pet names and shrieked oh oh stop what frightful language oh please if you're a lady remember oh mr davies you mustn't let her smoke curly says i you're shot and you've got to be good in a small voice or good says curly i'm a wolf i come from bitter creek the higher up the worse the waters and i'm from the source and it's my night to howl yow ow ow well miss pansy shrieked i call it disgraceful so there i don't care says curly i won't be good in a small voice and i'll call this dear old hoss thief all the names i please why chalka and me punch cows at holy cross say chalka do you remember when i stuck burrs in under your saddle and you got pitched to glory why that's the very old hat i shot full of holes and oh i do enjoy to see you so much you dear old villain then miss blossom dragged miss pansy away to cook supper and curly settled down with her little paw in my fist my habits says she is a sure scandal and i ain't got no more manners nor a bear 
my language ain't becoming to a young gentlewoman and my eating would disgrace at pinto hoss they can't refuse me a little bit and when i tries to set up on my tail and look pretty they tell me rebukes for crossing my legs like a cowboy oh take me away old chalkeye take me away to the range in the camps to feel the night frost again to sleep with the stars to see the sun come up to ride in the heat this roof sets down on me at night i can't see for walls i can't get air to breathe these ladies has roped me and thrown me tied down for brandon ears in the dust oh take me away from this when that bandage is off your arm i'll take you curly not till then she had scarcely strength yet to travel and yet if she fretted like this at being shut up in a house would she ever get well at all when i reflect what curly looked like then it makes me wonder what sort of raging lunatic i had been to leave her in that house by way of disguise she had a wig all sideways and female clothes which she'd never learned to wear they made her look like a man her skin had the desert tan she moved and talked like a cowboy but most of all her eyes gave her dead away the steel blue eyes of a scout more used to gunfights than to needlework which bored right through me only a frontiersman has eyes like that only the outlaw has the haunted look which comes with slaying of men and curly was branded that way beyond mistake this poor child was wanted as mccalmont's son hunted like a wild beast with a price on her head for murder and for robbery under arms and yet she was a woman say curly i asked what has these ladies done to account for your being here and they are home she reached to a table and gave me cuttings from the weekly obituary i failed to read in these the burial of buck hennessy at la soledad doggone hawkins report of not finding robbers the rescue of mccalmont's prisoners out of the jim crow shaft and the story of the posse which tracked the robbers north until the signs scattered out all over the country and every trace was lost the attempt of the stranglers to lynch a horse thief at las salinas the same being me then came a paragraph about a young lady staying at the home of the mrs jameson we are informed that miss hilda jameson of norfolk virginia arrived last week on a visit to her aunts the mrs jameson we regret to hear that on her journey westward this young lady met with an unfortunate accident being severely bruised on the arm by the fall of a valise out of an upper bunk in the sleeping car this bruise has developed a formidable abscess which the mrs jameson are treating by the peculiar methods of christian science of which craze they are well-known exponents for our part we would suggest the calling in of a doctor but as these ladies are way up experts at nursing we trust that their efforts will be successful and that in a few days more we shall see the young lady around enjoying all the pleasures of grave city society in the meantime miss blossom jameson wishes us to say that the patient needs absolute quiet and friends are requested not to call at the house until further notice as to the pleasures of grave city society says curly i'm plumb fed up already suppose they dream that i'll go back to shovelin manure in that stable i asked her if there had been any visitors at the house they came every day to inquire and miss blossom insulted them regular in the front yard now they've quit but nobody saw these ladies meeting a guest at the train no but you should hear miss blossom telling lies out there in the yard she's surely an artist curly says i pull that wig straight and hide up that scar in your brow can't you even pretend to act like a lady like a woman you mean you're not safe you'll be seen by some gossip through the window you'd ought to hole up in the bedroom and choke i'd as leaf get choked with a rope think of the risk i reckon a little excitement keeps me from feeling dull now don't you look so solemn 
with yo eye like a poached egg or i'll throw my wig at y'all say chalkeye do you calculate the loud made them two old ladies vicious why for looks to me as if they was born broke in and raised gentle with little lace caps on their heads and mittens on their pasterns i've been thinking fearful hard trying to just imagine miss pansy bad s'pose she was to kick or strike or rare up or buck or pitch or sunfish around to kill and miss blossom she only makes believe to be dangerous to hide up her soft old heart are real ladies all like that well usual they don't bite i was raised wild curly lay back tired my tribe are the young wolves and i reckon when the lord was serving out goodness he was sort of shamed lest we claim our share he must be plum busy too with his own people telling him their prayers why these two ladies requires whole heaps of attention i allow their souls must have got out of order a lot cause they has to put in enough supplications to save a whole cow camp entire they're so plumb talkative that a way that i can't get a prayer in edgewise she was getting tired and sleepy so i sat quiet watching then somebody came outside hammering the front door and i pulled my gun to be ready in case of trouble End of chapter twenty three Chapter twenty four of Curly by Roger Pocock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter twenty four The Saving of Curly. Miss Blossom was at the front door having great arguments with the man. If you got baby carriages to sell, says she, I claim to be a spinster and if it's lightning rods i don't hold with obstructing providence if it's insurance or books or pianolas or dress patterns or mowing machines you'd better just go home i'm proof against agents of all sorts i'm not at home to visitors and i don't feed tramps thar now you just clear out excuse me ma'am i know you mayn't allow me to introduce no you don't you come to the wrong house for that while well, i'm blessed if you're much more apt to get bit by my dog cause your breath smells of liquor and i'm enraged glad to hear it ma'am i congratulate the happy gentleman you've chosen well of all the impudence that's what my wife says impudence will the dog bite if i inquire for mr curly mccalmont my blood went to ice and i reckon miss blossom collapsed a whole lot to judge by the bang where she lit wall well, since you're so kind ma'am i'll just step in i heard him step in this way the lady was gasping for breath the dining room wow now this is surely the prettiest room and i do just admire to see such flowers miss blossom came catfoot to shut the parlor door and i heard no more curly was changing the cartridges in her revolver as she always did every evening scared she inquired sort of sarcastic about the nose shut your head do you want to be captured it would be a sort of relief from being so ladylike then a big gust of laughter shook the house and i knew that miss blossom's guest was the whitest man on the stock range sheriff brown naturally i had to go and see old dick so i told curly to keep good quit the parlor crossed the passage and walked right into the dining room one hand on my gun and the other thrown up for peace dick played up in the indian side top long time between drinks there's still land says my hand now may i inquire says miss blossom wall ma'am old dick cocked his gray eye sidewise this chalk eye person remarked that he languished for some whiskey upon which i rebuked him for projecting his drunken ambitions into a lady's presence 
the way he subdued miss blossom was plenty wondrous for she let out to find him the bottle sheriff says i as we shook hands your servant sir i left the sheriff part of me in my own pastures dick wrung my hand limp i don't aim to ride herd on the local criminals here so the hatchet is buried and the chiefs get nose paint miss blossom ma'am we only aspire to drink to the toast of beauty he filled up generous i look towards you ma'am i do despise a flatterer says miss blossom but i saw her blush wow to resume said dick this lady's guest miss hilda jamison of norfolk in old virginia is entitled to her own habits she is wounded most unfortunate all day but all night she is entitled to bulge around in a free country studying moonlight effects she's due to be whipped says miss blossom mighty wrathful on scenes of domestic bliss it is not my purpose ma'am to intrude i only allude to the fact that this young lady was pervading main street late last night happy and innocent in a gale of wind which it blew off her hat good gracious yes ma'am and naturally the hat being pinned her hair was blown off too it blew off perhaps ma'am this hair doesn't fit and the best thing would be to shoot the party who made the ornament the young lady of course was in no way to blame if it flew down the street and she after it i rise to observe that deputy marshal pedersen being a modest man was shocked most dreadful and oh oh miss blossom went white as the tablecloth go on said i let's know the worst at once and he couldn't stay to help the young lady cause he was running to catch the midnight train thank goodness yes ma'am he was due in lordsburg this morning to collect a hoss thief and nobody else saw the wig no ma'am only pedersen he came whirling down on me this morning at lordsburg with dreams and visions about a robber chasing a wig and a lady holed up in your home and the same being disguised as a woman but really a man and wanting two thousand dollars dead or alive for the wig which its name was curly it seemed a heap confused and unreliable this pedersen man says miss blossom is coming here to arrest her i mean him oh what's the use of talking speak man speak deputy marshal pedersen ma'am is now in prison arrested why sheriff says i what has he done to get arrested i don't know dick shook his gray head mournful i forget i had to exceed my authority a whole lot so the first thing i thought of was bigamy and confusion of mind i reckon i'll have to apologize and he's a low-flown crawler to beg pardon to you'll have to let him out i surely will meanwhile he's thinking of all his sins and he certainly looks like a mormon he never combs his hair but then you see i had to keep his paws off these honorable ladies until i could bring some sort of warning here Besides, if this person with a wig is really poor Curly McCormick, I feel that I've done right. What makes you think that, Bryant? Well, I happen to know that them witnesses in the Ryan inquest here was bribed to swear away the life of old Balshannon's son. The whole blamed business stinks of perjury. I may be wrong, you one-eyed fraud, but when Curly punched cows with you at Holly Cross, I sort of hungered for him. You see, my missus and me couldn't come past a son of our own, and we just wanted Curly. When he quit out from you all, we tried to catch him, but he broke away. Then came the big shooting match, six dead, and Balshannon quits out in the gun smoke, and you and the two youngsters outlawed for trying to save him that's how i reads the signs on this big war trail and being only a crazy old plainsman i takes the weaker side he reached out his palm put her there you one-eyed hoss thief and you'll know that there's one official in this whole corrupt and filthy outfit who cares for justice more than he cares for law
with warrants out against me on various charges and the grave city stranglers yearning to make me a corpse i had come on this visit feeling plenty bashful so it was good to have a genuine county sheriff acting chaperon the ladies gave us a great sufficiency of supper and then we made curly swear faithfully not to go hunting wigs in the moonlit streets afterwards the ladies went to roost and we two men having tracked out to tend the horses made down our beds in the barn loft next morning my natural modesty and certain remarks from the sheriff made me hide up out of sight but bryant went to town and did my shopping he bought me an iron-gray gelding which i had always longed to steal because he was much too good for the tenderfoot doctor who owned him it shocked my frugal mind to pay a hundred dollars cash but bryant was liberal with my money and the horse was worth a hundred and fifty anyhow he got me a second-handed saddle snaffle rope blanket a dandy pair of shacks leather armor for the legs spurs belt shirt overalls boots sombrero and all cowboy fixings if i was to take young curly back to robber's roost she needed a proper trousseau especially being due to meet jim i hate to put up all dull particulars but i ought to mention that mutiny robinson had located a good showing of silver the second east extension of the contention mine on my land at las salinas that is why for he put up six thousand dollars cash for my water spring fencing and adobe house getting clear title to the land which held his mineral rights it grieves me to think of mutiny grabbing all his present wealth because i couldn't hold down that place without being lynched such is the fruits of getting unpopular and i might preach a plenty improving sermon on the uncertainties of business the immorality of being found out the depravity of things in general the cussedness of fate mutiny waited sly while i plunged around conspicuous so now he's rich setting a good example while i'm as poor as a fox what with my bank deposit and the sale of my home dick brought me back nine thousand dollars in cash likewise i had in my war bags the money which mccalmont had trusted to my care for curly's dowry i gave dick charge of all this wealth taking only a thousand dollars for present expenses and stuffed the same in the treasure belt which i carry next my skin these proceedings were a comfort to me for i am here to remark and ready to back my statements with money arguments or guns that the handling of wealth is more encouraging to the heart than such lonesome games as the pursuit of virtue besides the plunder and curly's trousseau dick brought me chocolate creams a new breed of rim-fire cigars just strong enough to buck a quart of pickles and some medicine for our thirst the old drunkard knows what is good and before supper we sat in the barn with these comforts talking business it needs such surroundings of luxury to get my thoughts down to any manner of business for i hold that office work is adapted to town sharps only and not to men bryant and i had the misfortune to be named in lord balshannon's will as his executors to ride herd on his gym until such time as the colt could run alone in this business my co-robber had taken action already annexing the trainload of breeding cattle which had been stolen by jabez white stone these cattle were sold by auction and dick held the money swearing that nobody else but jim should get so much as a smell with regard to holy cross dick as sheriff had seized the old hacienda and the same must be sold to pay balshannon's debts to the ryan estate it seems that michael ryan claimed this plunder and that jim the natural heir had stolen michael there it stands says dick who has a legal mind until jim skins his mate that set me thinking of michael he was not likely to be special fat after his ride with the robbers i doubt says bryant that so shortly as jim does the skinning that ryan duck ain't got a tail feather left with these remarks he slanted away back to town having agreed to sup with the city marshal 
as for me i lay in the corn shucks full of dim wonderings about that pedersen person cramped in the cooler at lordsburg on bryant's charge of bigamy and confusion of mind the question was would he stay put the arrangement made with pedersen was only temporary not permanent like a proper funeral moreover in his place i should have felt mournful and ill-used i should have put up objections and struggles to find my way out suppose this person escaped or got loose by his lawyer or sent curly's address to the brave city police i was afflicted with doubts about said pedersen and my mind began to gloat on the joys of absence so i saddled the horses got ready for the warpath and watching until it was dark enough made a break for the back door of the house carrying curly's outfit to judge by the clatter in the house something had happened and when i broke in on the ladies i found them having hysterics over their copy of the weekly obituary i slung the cowboy gear to curly and bade her change herself quick because we must hit the trail on that the clatter got to a crisis as it does in a hen roost in the case of fox miss blossom called me all the names she could think of miss pansy sobbed at having to part with her little private robber miss curly whirled in telling the news in the paper all of them wanted to talk so i surely played fox to that hen roost chasing miss pansy out to pack us a lunch for the trail grabbing the paper from curly and scaring miss blossom with bad words until she got tame enough to attend to business she took curly into the bedroom and there was a sort of lull while i got my ears to work at the back door it's a true fact that i have a sort of sense which warns me of danger is coming it makes my hands tingle as if they were full of prickles and my heart beats loud so i can scarcely hear that minute i stood at the back door felt like whole hours of waiting so that i wanted to howl close by me in the kitchen miss pansy was sobbing about the bad words she had heard and through the mosquito knitting i could hear miss blossom oppressing curly while she changed her clothes i folded the newspaper and jammed it into my pocket studied the lay of the stable door to see how quick i could get the horses out and pulled my gun loose for war away towards the town i could hear the rumble of wheels half a mile coming on rapid miss pansy i called she quick ran this curly's in danger says i brace up act brave and when this wagon stops at the door meet the men who try to break in tell them you're not to home and give em some christian science she went quite cool to wait by the front door and now i could see the dust of a wagon come up against the afterglow in the sky miss blossom i called roll curly out through that window just as she is quick oh but curly i shouted come out coming fix that bed miss blossom lay in it with curly's wig and prepare to play dead curly came tumbling through the mosquito bar in the window dropped on her feet like a cat horses i whispered and she ran her spurs clattering outrageous along the gravel path the wagon had pulled up to the front gate somebody shouted i heard miss pansy screeching like a cougar and a man came surging past the side of the house lifting his gun to draw a bead on curly as she ran i jumped behind felled him with my gun butt and bolted what with miss pansy's shrieks and the shouting of men the clatter had got to be a whole disturbance rousing a quiet neighborhood as i ran i could hear miss blossom calling go away you rude men scat it seemed to me that time was worth a million dollars a second while i held the back gate by the stable and curly rode through with the horses straight on to the open range as i swung to the saddle i heard the house door battered in with a crash of breaking glass hold on said curly reining in her horse i was forgetting the searchers were swarming through the house and for my part i was full content to depart without telling them any good-bye your skirt says curly you coward you stay here 
then feeling for blood with her spurs she sailed at full gallop along the outer side of the garden fence at the first shot from the yard she ducked throwing herself until she hung indian fashion along the off side of her horse a bullet trimmed my back hair as i followed gun flames blazed from the back porch and the windows as we shot past the house the bullets were singing all round us our horses were crazy with fright but then we swung round the end of the garden fence running full tilt against the standing team of horses which the police had left in the road the shock stampeded them but curly swerved clear of their rush rolled back into the saddle raced abreast and shot both horses down a minute more and the firing died away behind us for we were racing neck and neck across the desert curly had left the police to follow afoot but now she began to weaken for because she had played the man she broke down and sobbed a woman we had been running maybe two hours when we pulled up on the top of a hill to rest our horses far down to southward the electric lights in the city made a silver haze of small specks glistening as though a scrap of sky had fallen there high in the south orion rode guard upon the star herds and the night was so still that we were scared to speak i wanted to smoke but on a night like that the striking of a match may be seen for miles around so i took a bite at my plug and ate tobacco instead then as curly and i sat on a rock together listening i heard a bear cough because his nose got dusty grubbing for ants a coyote was singing the hunger song and miles away to the east a ranch dog answered him then curly's horse scrunched up a tuft of grass and my beast pawing started a rattlesnake the little woman beside me whispered then surely the law makes his big medicine for us for snakes and robbers wolves and bars only the folk down thou can't see him cause they got electric lights instead of stars which them two poor ladies says i gets gun flame by way of lamps to cheer them up to-night i hate to think how we all stood their peace still bright has stroked their fur by now she sighed them visitors rumpled me too and all my brussels is pointing the wrong way still do you reckon curly i asked that the city marshal is hoping to trail us by starlight not to her she yawned except maybe he's got smell dogs guiding his possum yes i remember a while back the marshal bought a team of bloodhounds she didn't seem to take much interest so i propose that we roll our tails i see his lantern said curly there it is again we got a ten mile start i saw the glimmer then come on said i poco tiempo says curly i'm fearful sorry for them poor ladies yonder i dragged her away and we rode on throwing the miles astern every two hours or so curly would give the horses a rest and a taste of grass a trick she had learned from indians which kept them fresh for a trail the night was cold with a little lazy wind as curly called it too tired to go round so it went right through us just before dawn we crossed a clay flat holding a slough of mud and found it hard with frost when water goes to sleep with cold says curly a smell dog's nose ain't going to guide his legs this frost is due to send the posse home at dawn they'll see our tracks dawn broke and we were rising a slope of sand drift with acres of naked rock ahead of us ha said curly leading me to the left until we entered the rock field gee she called and we crossed the rocks to the right follow the rocks shy wide of any sand i followed for a mile until a little hill shut off the route we had come by dismount she said and i stepped down by the edge of the sands she made me take the saddle blankets the oilskin coats and a serape mexican blanket and make a pathway of them across the sand on which she rode leading my horse while i renewed the track in front of her for a couple a hundred feet so we left 
horse sign on the sand which looked a whole fortnight old then gathering the clothes i mounted and curved away among sand hills for half an hour sailing along at a lope until we came to a patch of gramma grass let the hosses graze said curly and sat side saddle resting while she smoked a cigarette i did the same and the tracks we left now were those of grazing horses not those of travellers then i resaddled and all set we rode off again to the north the frost had spoiled our scent the blanket play and grazing play had shirked the scourged trekkers curly says i you heap big injun a little small robber she answered giving away trade secrets a few miles northward we circled up beyond a ridge of hills to a good lookout point from there we could see the marsh's posse small as ants in the distance ranging around on the rock flat from whence they presently crawled off south looking a lot subdued then i unsaddled while curly killed out a few centipedes scorpions rattlers and other local vermin to make our sleep comfy under the rocks at noon when the heat awoke us we rode on to texas bob's big spring reaching his camp by sundown there we made up for lost mails by taking in four at once mrs bob gave us jerked beef spiced bread and coffee her wild range kids rubbed down our horses watered them and fed the old gentleman himself poured in his best advice until curly crept off to sleep as for me i felt good sitting there in the hut of cactus sticks watching the gold grass slowly change to gray and great big stars come out above the hills the long hair lay like silver around the old man's shoulders the white beard pointed short wagged over his deerskin shirt his kind eyes wrinkled with fun and all his words were wisdom absolute i reckon he's the wisest man in all the southern desert and when i told him the things i ought not to have done he showed me better how to act in future stealing a woman says he is different from stealing hosses you can make the hosses forget their home range in a month but a woman will sure break fences to quick back to the man she wants this curly will run to her mate and war they graze there ain't room for you in the pasture the good book says no man shall put them asunder and the rules of right and wrong ain't got exceptions don't you try to steal curly in all my life i never needed a friend so much as i did that night but when curly and i hit the trail the old scout reached me his hand put her right there chaka says he it's mighty hard at times to stick to the rules of the game it's so easy to go crooked that it takes a man to play straight and you'll play straight adios all night my mind was at ease and when day broke again we were into the superstitious mountains so i led curly down towards echo spring and gave the long yell to my boys where they lay in camp End of chapter 24chapter 25 of curly by roger pocock this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter 25 a million dollars ransom in giving my own account of this unpleasantness which happened between the duchesne and ryan families i've just grabbed truth by the tail and tried to stay right with her but truth runs swift and raises plenty dust of lies round her heels so maybe whirling along i miss good facts happens i've been poorly provided with one eye and a lot of prejudice to see the trail ahead likely i've not been the only party interested anyway outsiders could watch the stampede without getting choked with dust now these conclusions struck me abrupt like a bat in the eye when i sat down to rest in camp at echo spring before leaving grave city while thinking of other worries i had caught a copy of a local paper stuffed the same in my rear pocket and disremembered having such possessions 
I never thought of it until my tigers, hungering for news, caught sight of the bulging paper and rushed my camp to grab. Then I unfolded the weekly obituary to these boys, all setting around on their tails and pointing their ears for instruction. I read to them about a certain shock-eyed Davies, who seemed to be a most astonishing, outrageous villain, performing simultaneous crimes in several places at once. My tigers heard for more. Then came a whole page of revelations concerning the kidnapped Croesus, otherwise styled the stolen millionaire, and the brigands prey. It was clearly proved that the chalk villain, Jim Duchesne, described as a broken-down swell, and Captain McCalmont had joined together in purloining Michael Ryan and hiding him up in a cave, the place being well known to the authorities. This cave was inaccessible by land and water, guarded with machine guns and supplied with all modern conveniences, especially searchlights. Our special representative had been there, but declined to give particulars for fear of driving the bandits to still more desperate measures. Then came the weekly obituary gallery of fine portraits. We knew them all well, because they were served up frequent to represent murderers, politicians, actresses, preachers, scandalous British duchesses, and other notorious persons. Now they represented McCalmont, Curly, Chalkeye, Jim, Michael Ryan, Mrs. Michael, and old Mrs. Ryan. The weekly obituary said it was wishful with these identifications to assist the ends of justice. After this, the next page was all quotations from leading papers throughout the Republic, proving how plumb depraved the robbers were, how wicked it was to purloin the rich and good out of their private cars, and how the federal government ought to act in this shocking catastrophe. The New York papers just burned themselves with wrath because Michael's present engagements prevented him a whole lot from attending to railroad business. His financial combine was due to collapse complete unless he took hold at once. Last came our special supplement with the very latest news. It seems that Michael had written to his wife in New York, likewise that somebody stole the letter from her and sold it to the New York megaphone. Then all the papers copied Michael's letter and laid the blame on the megaphone. Here is the letter. September 8, 1900. Dear Kathleen, on 28th Alt, I was abducted at Grave City out of my car by brigands and carried blindfold, lashed onto the back of a horse for several hundred miles through frightful country, arriving here for instant. When I got here, I weighed ninety-eight pounds. Indeed, I was nearly dead. But now the robbers are feeding me up, so that I'm gaining flesh, although I'm still kept prisoner in close confinement. I don't know the whereabouts of this house, but it's a large ranch building of logs in the middle of pine woods. At nights, I'm almost frozen, so it must be high up in some range of mountains. The country looks flat from the window. A robber told me once that the place is in California. Now, dearest, you will take this as my authority and raise the sum of one million dollars to pay my ransom and save me from being murdered. You know who to go to and offer securities for the loan. Get in the best terms you can. This money must be paid one-tenth in U.S. gold currency and the balance in notes of fifty dollars and under. Bring it to Flagstaff in Arizona and ask for military escort. There you will charter a wagon and have the treasure delivered at the point where the Tuba Trail from Flagstaff crosses the Little Colorado River, right in the middle of the Painted Desert. The wagon must then be abandoned and the escort to withdraw to Canyon Diablo, leaving no spies behind. The chief of the robbers tells me that the man he sends with a team to get this wagon will be a perfectly innocent farmer 
and that any parties attempting to molest join or follow him will be killed so quick they'll never know what struck them i must earnestly warn you as you value my life to prevent any attempt whatever to watch or track the wagon or prior to my release to permit any hostile movement against the robbers or to deliver any money short of the full ransom or to mark any coin or note for future identification if the terms are not absolutely complied with in every detail within forty days from date that is by noon of eighteenth october i shall be murdered if the ransom is delivered as per instructions by eighteenth october and found correct the robbers will then disperse and have no further use for me they promise then to deliver me at the nearest ranch or farm on or before first november Private now dearest of my own free will and without compulsion from the robbers i want to ease my mind of a great burden by confessing to you as i shall to holy church if ever i get the chance under this dreadful visitation i see things in their true light which before were hid i guess there's not the slightest doubt that lord balshannon was one of the blackest scoundrels that ever disgraced this earth apart from his odious crimes in ireland his later life was steeped in villainy for years at holy cross ranch he was in open league with this gang of robbers who have captured me one of them chaka davies the notorious horse thief was his foreman and captain mccalmont's son went there to get educated in crime once balshannon actually hired the gang to rob my father of seventy five thousand dollars under such circumstances i am awed by the sublime courage of my father in this single-handed war against balshannon and his outlaws i stood at father's side in the last fight when balshannon murdered him i fired first in the fusillade which avenged the old man's death and untrained as i am to such wild warfare of the frontier i try to be worthy of my blood but when i think of balshannon's son i realize now that he fought for his father as i fought for mine afterwards blinded with passion i brought a charge against him and swore that he alone was guilty of my father's death i had no right to do that the young chap was innocent the charge was a put-up job but the evil one must have possessed me entirely for when several witnesses thought they could please me by swearing jim's life away i was a party to their perjuries more i was induced to help them with money to leave the country and so escape arrest if i sinned i am punished for as the robbers were balshannon's partners so they took sides with his son because i attacked the lad they abducted me that is my punishment kathleen and it is just in one thing i am puzzled because i expected to find balshannon's son with the robbers i have not seen him and mccalmont swears that jim de chesney took no part in this outrage kathleen we've got to do right in this business i want the charge against james de chesney withdrawn right now when i am free i shall give him back his home and lands all that father sees and ask him to forget that there was ever a quarrel between our families dear love it breaks my heart to think of your anxiety as for my business interests i dare not think of what may be involved by my long absence malvernine you must save me quick or worse will happen yet your distracted lover michael it made me sorry to think of that poor devil you see he tended strict to business first then strutted a while to show himself off to his woman before he unfolded his crooked little soul in the part marked private his letter gave me plenty to think about still i had my own concerns to worry me for monte took me round our herd which had grown in surprising ways during my absence the mares it seemed had gotten more prolific than usual giving birth to full-grown horses ready for an on the whole i concluded that if any of the neighbors happened around my boys would find that pasture unhealthy with symptoms of lead poisoning i advised them to quit 
so they agreed to ship the herd along eastward and sail out in texas meanwhile i cut out curly's buckskin mare and a few of my own pet runners who knew how to show their tails to any pursuers we took twelve good stayers from the herd and a little wall-eyed pack mule who had fallen dead in love with curly's mare so curly and i were ready for our march as to that young person from the moment she hit the trail out of grave city the wound in her arm healed rapid and she sure forgot to be an invalid two days we fed and rested her but then she began to act warlike oppressing me for sloth on the third morning i loaded the pack mule told the boys good-bye and trailed off with curly pointing for robber's roost when water won't cure thirst but the juice in your mouth turns to slime caking in lumps on your lips when the skin dries up because there's no more sweat when your eyes ache and your brain mills round that's arizona the air shakes in waves like a mist of cobwebs and through that quiver the landscape goes all skewed for some of the mountains float up clear of the land and some turn upside down standing on rows of pillars along the skyline then the hollows of the land fill with blue mist blue lakes and cactus bushes change into waving palm trees by the waterside how can a man keep his head when the world goes raving crazy all round him you have just to keep on remembering that your eyes have quit being responsible that your nose is a liar that your ears are fooled then keep a taut rein on yourself for fear your wits stampede and your legs go chasing visions down the trail to death that valley of central arizona got me plumb bewildered a country of bare earth and mesquite brush black mist with huge big trees of cactus standing in one grove a hundred miles across then came a hillside of black cinders lifting a hundred miles but the top was a level mesa surely the first place i ever seen with good grass under pine trees i had never seen woods before and this coconino forest is the sort of pasture i'd want to go after this present life a hunger none for golden pavements or any desert layout nor am i wishful for a harp having a taste for guitars nor for flopping around on wings nor a crown of glory the same being ostentatious a whole lot pasture like this a horse a camp a spring such promises as them would lure me to being good right in the heart of this forest there's a bunch of dead volcanoes called the san francisco peaks lifting their frosty heads into the sky and round the skirts of lava at their feet lies broken country curly showed good judgment in making camps but hereabouts i thought she had lost her wits for she led me over broken lava flows heartbreaking ground for the horses where we had to dismount and climb then all of a sudden we dropped down hid from all the world into a meadow walled around with lava this tract had escaped when the rest was overflowed so happened there was grass among the bull pines and right at the head of the field a little cave with space of floor for camping beside a bubbling spring we struck the place at noon and camped my partner concluding to lie over until she could make a night scout in search of news she slept through the afternoon while i stood guard outside up to that time we had been scared to make fire at night or show a smoke by day except for the minutes when we needed boiling coffee besides that we could never camp within ten miles of a water hole but had to ride on after drinking to win the nearest grass this country being all ate up around the pools here we had grass and water the cave to hide our fire and certainty besides of not being caught without warning it was mighty fine to set around the fire after supper you chalk up curly lit up a cigarette and broke into silence which had lasted days what does it feel like b 
being safe we're safe enough here little partner till i hit the trail for this scouting but i mean to live safe day after day without nobody ever wanting to kill you ain't it some monotonous not to hurt it must feel sort of neglected i read a book once about folks in england which i kept on reading and reading to see if anything happened except meals and go to bed and get up in the morning the girl was a sure enough fool and as to the boy well he wore government socks and didn't love the law then he married a widow by mistake which she had a forked tongue a bad eye and parted her hair on one side looking rather cute that boy just aimed to cut his throat for seventy-three pages then didn't after all which was plumb discouraging instead of that he got a government job inspecting the clouds and drawing salary then the witty she talked herself to death and quit out afterwards that boy took sixty-one pages to get a kiss from the heroine there was a deanery in it and a funny parrot i reckon that's all the story they married sure and nothing happened ever afterwards said kids them characters was awful safe from getting excited will it be that away when i get tame enough to marry jim feeling that said jim was a lot unworthy of her i strayed out to study how much our camp was visible it seemed like we couldn't be attacked without our visitors cussing around first in the lava they'd bark their shins and we'd hear gentle protests when i came back curly was brooding still about her jim he'll be a duke like the old patron says she and sure as i'm a lady i'll be tired of life robes go with that job and a golden crown such as the angels wear i reckon that's only for sunday best i told her to go to church why now ain't that just fine and how my wolves would laugh to see she stood up swaggering before the fire her hand on her revolver her laugh ringing echoes round the cave just you think says she of me a lady footmen at the church door to announce us lord and lady balshannon and jim and me goes button along to our pew then the preacher he rears up to talk his sermon my lord my lady and you common ordinary brethren can't you see jim spit on his crown and give it a rub with his sleeve and me snarled up in my robe like a roped hoss then we ride off home to the castle and jim says be shrew thee go to thou varlet and wrastle the grub pile for i shoot the cook then the valet says there's a deputy marshal come to arrest us both for stealing cows so jim has him hung in the moat afterwards we put in the whole afternoon shooting foxes and other british sports until it's time for supper then play stud poker beside the parlor stove you're to come and stop with us chalkeye sing to me curly says i because her voice was sweet enough to gentle a grizzly bear and it always moved my fur it seems to me i can see her now her eyes green and flame in the firelight her face i can't describe her face here's a moccasin track in the dress it's no more than the length of me hand and in her instep just see how it lifts if that ain't just the best in the land for the maid ran as free as the wind and her foot was as light as the snow why as sure as i follow i'll find me a kiss while her red blushes grow here's two small little feet and a skirt here's a soft little heart all aglow see me trail down the dear little flirt by the sign which she left in the snow did she run twas a hint to make haste and why bless her i'm sure she won't mind if she's got any kisses to waste why she knew that a man was behind did she run cause she's only afraid no for sure twas to set me the pace and i've fallen in love with a maid when i ain't had a sight of her face 
there she is and i knew she was near will she pay me a kiss to be free will she hate will she love will she fear why the darling she's waiting to see in all the thousands of campfires dotted along the trail of my life that one is best to think of surely i believe that the big spirit sent us poor little spirits loose on the earth to be kicked and educated not to have nice times looking around at present facts we see how life is a cold hard business proposition so we have to keep a mighty sharp lookout for fear of being kicked off the premises the future glows with hope gay as a sunrise the past is full of memories shining glorious like the setting sun seems to me that in eternity when the cold present is mixed up with all the rainbow colors of past and future why then i'll hear curly's voice come soft through the pines and see her face in the fire where i camp so in my poor way i dream in this lone camp where i sit at present perhaps says you i'd better wake up right now and tend to my story at midnight curly rode into the town of flagstaff afterwards following the grand canyon trail at daybreak she happened by accident on a stagecoach broken down with a load of tourists the driver chanced to be a retired robber gone tame with rheumatism so she helped him to fix his linchpin which had snapped as to the tourists they were plumb content to find a real live cowboy who would talk to them most punchers steer shy of tourists but curly enjoyed them she was always curious as a young antelope at anything unusual in the way of game so she borrowed all their newspapers to read to her dying mother which was me then she told them good advice about keeping alert at night to watch for robbers on that the teamster cheered them up by divulging how robbers drink human blood to keep their courage boiling and how they like a baby when they are staled on pork curly imparted a few particulars and rode away with a high tail i was still asleep when she came whirling into camp whooping for breakfast rabbits show a leg says she and set out the grub pile swift while i go wrangle the hosses we get a move on ourselves right after breakfast there was something unusual i thought about the way she talked a sort of high-strung excitement as to her face that was pale as ashes by the time i'd cooked bacon and slapjacks she had the horses in and fresh mounts saddled how's flagstaff i asked while she washed herself at the spring ain't this just purty she said to the bubbling water flagstaff why it sure is the craziest town i ever seen her laugh was harsh to hear you been showing your face in the street well partly but i covered up half my complexion to look like the toothache so she stuffed a ball of a handkerchief into her near cheek bound the towel around her jaw and looked most miserable oh throw me a dentist she howled then broke out laughing i surely did act pitiful and why for is this town loco i felt the girl was laughing so as not to cry well says she there's joe beef the utah sheriff and a lot of little no account sheriffs there's a fat united states marshal with a chin whisker and a heap o deputies there's cowboys scouts and trackers reporters ambulances dogs pony soldiers have the navajos broke out no the pale face has broke out it's a whole epidemic and there's an outfit on the war trail in utah another on the san juan in colorado and they're going to eat up robber's roost and you chalkeye looking glum as a new-laid widow scat you has they gone mad i asked the moment they make a break for robber's roost mccallment will kill this ryan scatter his wolves and vanish this must be only the escort for ryan's ransom it's plumb ridiculous but there ain't no ransom you're dreaming curly this project of troops is sure death to ryan 
they'd risk the killing of a common ordinary man but a millionaire that's where the joke comes he ain't a millionaire i saw her quit her breakfast all untasted can't you be serious child for once i asked but it made me ache to see her face that way i daren't be serious i daren't think i daren't just you look at them papers i snatched at the nearest paper opened it and thought i must have been loco there were the headlines ryan combine smashed collapse of the trust panic on change the kidnapped millionaire a confessed perjurer and corrupter of witnesses admits that he swore away the life of an innocent man behold thy financial gods o israel i read on dazed with the news public confidence at an end investors jump from under ryan debentures a frost shares thrown on the ash heap petition in bankruptcy mrs ryan abandons all hope of a ransom federal government pledged to wipe out the bandits movement of troops sheriff joe beef interviewed on the situation forces taken the field one of the robbers offers himself as a guide curly was pulling my sleeve come here she said and there was surely something awful in her voice look see that dragonfly she whispered and all them flowers using the spring for a mirror bending low and here the bull pines whisper smell the great strong scent look thar at the blue sky and the cloud herds grazing that's like my home old chaka such sounds such good smells such woods and such a heaven overhead the boys air gentling hosses in the big corral or riding out to get a deer for supper my father sits in the doorway strumming hymns on his old guitar his dogs around him his little small cat pawing around to heaven and jim is there my jim can't i be serious don't i think ain't i seeing that all blackened ruins bloody ground dead corpses rotten down by the corrals shadows of black wings across the yard oh god of mercy spare em, spare my wolves my home my father and jim is there she turned against me raging what air you waiting for has you just got to stand round all day you're scared that's what's the matter with y'all afraid to even carry a warning what do you want to pack the kitchen for i'm sure you stay thar she jumped to her, her horse she sprang to the saddle she lashed her spurs for blood and whirled away to the northward End of chapter twenty five